welcome everyone to the virtual world of the East Side Freedom Library. Uh, I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director, uh, and I'm delighted to be hosting this program organized by our colleagues and collaborators with the Twin Cities Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, we've worked on a number of programs with them over the past several years, um, and uh, there have been great conversations and discussions. Uh, and we're looking forward to today and also several events coming up in the next month. So I want to encourage you to look at the Eastside Freedom Library website, eastsidefreedomlibrary.org, uh, and click on events and we'll take you to our calendar of upcoming events. Um, also, if you click on get involved, uh, you can sign up for our twice a month electronic newsletter and, and another way of finding out what's going on. So I want to turn the platform over to my colleague, uh, Vinny Taguchi, the president of the Twin Cities Japanese American Citizens League, um, who is going to lead us through today's program. Vinny? Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's really great to see everyone here today. It's always a pleasure to partner with the Eastside Freedom Library and support some of the amazing content that they do. Um, as Peter mentioned, my name is Vinny Taguchi. I have the pleasure of serving as the current president of the Japanese American Citizens League Twin Cities chapter. Um, the program here today was developed in partnership between the JACL and the uh, Tutor for Solidarity Minnesota chapter. So we're very excited to bring it here today. Um, I also have personal interest in this topic because I'm a Japanese Brazilian, so I'm always excited to have these spaces where people with um, kind of, you know, less talked about uh, Japanese American backgrounds uh, get to tell their stories. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, our organization or learning about future events that we have, I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat for where you can sign up for our email list. Um, but without further ado, I wanted to get on with some uh, bookkeeping um, topics here. So this is going to be a, a virtual event. We're in the meeting format. So we ask that you please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off, um, uh, or I mean, your camera's up to you, but just so you know that this event is being recorded, um, we will have some chance for you to ask questions in the chat and we'll bring those up during the conversation, but we're, probably going to be a little tight on time. So I don't think we'll have the chance for people to speak their questions. Um, as you've noticed, we have uh, Holly, who is our ASL interpreter at the moment. And there's going to be another interpreter hopping on and, and kind of switching off and on. So please make sure that you have that video pinned if that is a uh, service that you would like to be viewing. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, esteemed speaker, Selena Moon. Uh, Selena is a Japanese American historian and writer who researches and writes about Japanese American mixed race and disability history. She is writing a middle grade and picture book about disabled Japanese American children in World War II incarceration camps, which began during her Loft Literary Center Mirrors and Windows Fellowship in 2020. She received her BA from Smith College and MA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And through her work with the Free Thinking Abolitionists Interpreting Racism Fair Collective, uh, which is creating a traveling exhibit to teach children about racism, the Disabled Academic Collective, DAC, and several committees, uh, she is working to make the world a just and safe place for all. So we're going to hear from Selena now, and then we're going to open it up to a panel discussion with our other speakers, Aino and Zara, who I'll be introducing at that point. So thank you, and take it away, Selena. Oh, Selena, you're on mute. Sorry, too many things trying to do at the same time. <laughs> um, so I can explain first how I got here. Um, and it started in undergrad. I took a, an American studies course about Japanese American uh, incarcerees who had written 
autobiographies, poetry, literature, uh, fiction about the incarceration. And it was the first time I had ever learned about it in school in any depth. And while reading Farewell to Manzanar, um, one of the uh, people who, Jean, who was about seven at the time, mentioned was a little girl whose parents were a Japanese man and a woman she believed was half Black and I think half Japanese American. Um, she explained that the woman was a tall, broad woman who I realized much later was half Black, passing as Japanese to remain with her husband in camp. Uh, she wore scarves to cover her giveaway hair. And I was absolutely fascinated because, A, I thought that you know, interracial marriage was completely illegal at the time, and B, had never really thought about mixed families in camp. And so my project for the class was looking at mixed families and how they fared in camp. And interestingly, um, everything that I first looked at was for families that were non-Japanese or Japanese American and non-white. Um, and a lot of the issues that they had to go, to, go through in camp um, and all the discrimination that they faced in camp because they were in such a minority as well, including one example where the government got so overzealous in wanting to incarcerate Japanese Americans that they rounded up a couple who were fully Native Alaskan solely because the husband had his Japanese American stepfather's surname and brought them to camp. Um, and there were so many families who were brought to camp and I was absolutely fascinated by this and it's been an ongoing journey ever since. Um, and realizing so much of what needs to be publicized because a lot of it has just been um, so much in the background and ignored. Um, so, oops trying to do this. There we go. Sorry, it looks different from the way I normally got it. So let me see. Okay, I know. All right. Uh, that's why. There we go. Okay. Okay. So, um, mixed race Japanese American history is much longer and more complicated than I think anybody has ever really talked about. It actually dates back to the 1840s and 50s um, in Hawaii. And the first let's see, about 20 years or so of mixed Japanese American history is Japanese American and non-white or mixed white and non-white, uh, mostly in uh, Hawaiian, at least in the beginning. Um, so Japan from roughly 1609 um, to 1853 was in this uh, period of isolation. So the country was closed to outsiders except the Dutch in a certain portion of Japan and Japanese were not allowed to leave the country. Um, and so there uh, really wasn't a lot of communication with the outside world um, and not a lot of mixing of any kind going on. And there were a few people who left the country, mostly shipwrecked sailors and so on, who were rescued by various countries. Um, and one of them was some fishermen um, who were roughly about 14 to about 18 years old. 
um, who were shipwrecked in 1843. And, um, oops. There we go, that's why. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so Nakahama Manjiro, as he would later be called, is one of the most well-known. I won't be getting into him, um, but the others were named Toraemon and brothers Goemon and Denzo and, they, and Juzo, and they were shipwrecked and rescued by a ship called the John Howland um, and taken to Hawaii. Well, Manjiro had gotten to be friends with the captain. So he went off to the mainland and the others stayed in Hawaii. And since they believed that they wouldn't be allowed to go back to Japan on pain of death, they decided to stay and create families and you know, um, obtain Hawaiian citizenship. Hawaiian was an independent kingdom at the time. And so, not only did they gain citizenship, but I also believe, and I don't quite have proof of this, um, they gained citizenship to get married because at the time you had to have Hawaiian citizenship to marry a Hawaiian. And so um, they did that. And actually, I'm not quite sure on this. This gets a little complicated, but um, in uh, 1847, Toraemon uh, marries. And so the date that he marries and the date that he gained his citizenship are the same date. And the image on the right is his marriage entry in, in the registers. And he married a woman um, whose name, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably mispronounce. Uh, Kal Sorry, I'm probably not going to try to pronounce that. I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't want to mispronounce that. But anyway, um, and it's crossed out. I'm not sure if that means they didn't get married or what happened. Um, but then a couple of years later, Goemon uh, also marries. And soon after he marries, Goemon and Denzo uh, meet Manjiro again, who would come back from the mainland and decide to go back to Japan. So he leaves his newlywed wife and goes back to Japan and unfortunately doesn't make it back um, because he died a few years later, uh, right before Japan opens its doors to trade with the main, uh, with uh, the United States. So he couldn't come back before that, um, unfortunately. And no word, whatever, on what happened to Toraemon or his wife. Um, interestingly, there are some tantalizing clues shortly. Um, so after the 1850s, there really wasn't a lot of Japanese Americans because the country hadn't opened yet. There were a few fishermen who may have trickled in, um, but mass migration didn't begin until 1868 when the Japanese government finally said, okay, you can all leave the country now. Um, you know, laborers wanted to go and um, earn income because they didn't have that Japan being in, you know, the aftermath of lots of wars and conflict and so on. Um, and so there really uh, big group, the first group were a group of about 150 people, uh, mostly single men and a couple of wives and one child and the first Japanese, and I use the term loosely, American, because uh, Hawaii again was still an independent kingdom who was born shortly after the ship arrived in 1868. And interestingly, you know, these men didn't marry for another roughly 20, 15, 20 years. But in between that time, so the 1870s, 1880s, there were several uh, marriages between um, Hawaiian women and men who were classified as Japanese in the registers. Now, whether they were actually Japanese, as in somebody from Japan, or whether they were, for example, the children of, say, Toraemon or Goemon, um, who had Japanese ancestry, uh, is unclear. Um, but apparently, they had gained Hawaiian citizenship to marry the women because that law was still in effect. Um, so a man named Toyo 
1874, Matthew in 1877, and Hatch, probably an English pronunciation of something like Hachiro. Um, in 1883, all Japanese married um, women, Rebecca Jackson, Maria um, Maka, Maka Okena, and Kari Kikui, uh, respectively. The last two were listed as Hawaiian, and Rebecca's um, background is unknown. So again, there's another mystery that unfortunately probably won't be solved. Um, and so after a few years, the, the group of men who arrived in 1868 started getting married only about roughly 10 so far that I've found married Hawaiian women. Um, the others sort of disappear into history. Uh, interestingly, one of the men who uh, married early, Sentaro Ishii, uh, had, so he had actually fled an arranged marriage in Japan and landed in Hawaii, perhaps before the first migration. So maybe as early as 1866 or thereabouts um, and married Kahele and that was one of the first marriages. The next generation, uh, or the next set of marriages, roughly in the 1880s. So, one of those marriages was between Joseph Matsugoro and Mar Maria Figuera, who was a Portuguese immigrant. Uh, she and her parents had come over from Portugal to work, like many of the Japanese immigrants, on the sugar plantations. And they had. I want to say 14 children. Um, and one of their children, Joseph Jr., uh, married Elika Pekka, who was the adopted daughter of Queen uh, Kaipolani, who was Queen Liliokolani, the last Queen of Hawaii's sister. Um, so their descendants still exist as technically Hawaiian royal descendants. Um, and so there wasn't any mass migration until roughly the 1880s. And even then women were few and far between. So a lot of the children of these men and women were also intermarrying with Hawaiians, other immigrants, uh, mixed race people uh, on the Hawaiian islands. And onto the mainland incidentally. Um, so, Hawaii has a bit of a different history, so I won't really get much into that, but uh, the mainland United States was just the contiguous 48 at this point, um, had many, many laws trying to prevent interracial marriage and interracial relationships. Um, interestingly, in contrast to Japan, um, Japan legalized interracial marriage in 1873 and has not made any laws to prohibit interracial marriage since then. Um, on the other hand, the US was slowly uh, preventing people from intermarrying with states having all kinds of laws. Um, the first one in 1880 was when Asians were being prohibited from intermarrying. Um, this was when Chinese immigration was high. So there was trying to prevent mostly white people from intermarrying with Chinese people. And then as Japanese immigration increased, various states included quote unquote Mongolians and other populations to try to cover all their bases in preventing mostly white Asian marriages. Um, interestingly, there wasn't a lot of restriction in many states at the time between um, non-white intermarrying each other. It was mostly to keep the white bloodlines, quote unquote, pure, um, that they were passing laws. And a lot of the laws were more restric restrictive of white women. You know, white women had more in, uh, racial groups that they couldn't intermarry with, while white men had a little more freedom to intermarry with uh, different groups. Um, and it gets more and more complicated as the years go by. So not only are they prevented from marrying, um, 
women eventually start losing their citizenship, their US citizenship for marrying what the government called aliens ineligible for citizenship Asians um, between 1866 and 1931. And initially it was that they only lost their citizenship if they married somebody from a foreign country, including a white person, uh, and left the country. In 1907, the law changed so that no matter who they married and where they lived, if they married a foreign person, then they automatically lost their citizenship, regardless of whether they lived in the US or abroad, because it was assumed that um, when you married a foreign man, you sort of got subsumed into his family and became a citizen of that country. Um, and so white women eventually in 1921 regained their citizenship, even if they married an alien Ill ineligible for citizenship. Um, but Japanese American women were now aliens ineligible for citizenship and they didn't get the right to get their citizenship back until 1831. Um, so they were stateless for a while, depending on whether they had Japanese citizenship from birth or not. Um, and of course, Japanese women who married um, American men also lost their Japanese citizenship and they were also stateless. But this is a whole another topic that I could spend a week talking about. Um, and so many of the couples went to some states that allowed interracial marriage because not all uh, states prohibited it. Um, so for example, couples would go from California to Washington state or even down to Mexico to marry um, so that they could uh, circumvent the laws. And so that's how they did that. And so the first couples Interracial Japanese US marriages were in the West Coast because that was where the migration in the contiguous 48 began. So in 1869, a year after the mass migration to Hawaii, um, the first mass migration to California begins with a group of about 20 people um, who went to the Wakamatsu colony in Placerville, California uh, near um, Coloma, where the gold rush was in 1849. And their leader was a man named John Schnell, who was a Prussian military man who had helped the Japanese military um, fight during their uh, battle before it became a united country, because before Japan became united in the 18. Uh, 60s, it was a bunch of um, warring states, literally called the warring states period. And so John had a Japanese wife named Jo, and they had a daughter named Frances. And their daughter Mary was born around 1870 as the first mixed race Japanese American born in the contiguous 48 that we know of. Um, and unfortunately, the colony, which had brought over all kinds of silkworms, tea leaves, all kinds of um, Japanese products, failed due to drought and a few other issues. And the colony disbanded and everybody scattered. Most of them went back to Japan, but about three people stayed. And one of them uh, was Kuni, who was about 21 when he arrived in the United States. And he moved to Coloma and met a woman named Caroline uh, Wilson, whose family was a blacksmith, owned a blacksmith shop, owned a lot of the land in Coloma. And Carrie may have been also part native. There's not quite some conclusive evidence yet, um, but the two of them got married. There were no anti-miscegenation laws in California yet, so they, they could get married. Um, and so their marriage certificate is actually on, on the right here. That's a picture of their actual marriage certificate. Um, and so they lived in Coloma. Cooney had lots of jobs translating. He actually also learned Spanish so he could speak three languages. Um, he also worked in gold mines and did all kinds of other jobs. Unfortunately, California law at the time prohibited Japanese Americans or again, aliens ineligible for citizenship from having mining rights. Um, so Kuni didn't get any of the uh, 
uh, elements that he mined. So he actually blew up the mine because he couldn't uh, get his profits. And so, um, so they're the most well-known of the early couples. And there were also several, according to census records in the 1880 census of couples believed to be part uh, Japanese and American, though at the time, of course, census takers probably wouldn't have known the difference between various Asian countries. So they may have not actually been Japanese, um, might have been Chinese, Korean, et cetera. Um, and so um, there are many, 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 many more marriages and couples who I could talk about, but we would be here for a long, long time. Um, so one of the uh, later couples to marry was in 1836 in Washington state. Uh, so Fred Egoa and Grace Margaret Celestine, who was of the Lumi tribe in uh, Washington state were married. And so Grace um, had gone to one of the Native American boarding schools and was now on the reservation and would again be incarcerated in a different kind of location um, in a few years. But there were also several other Native and Japanese couples, uh, including with the Paiute tribe um, and uh, along the West Coast and other parts of the country. And I'll talk about uh, the Igawas in a little bit as well. Um, and so another group of indigenous people who often gets overlooked are the indigenous um, Japanese people in mostly in Hokkaido in the north uh, and Okinawa in the south. And so the native people of Hokkaido are called Ainu and the native people of Okinawa are called Ryukyu. Um, and Ryukyu Islands is also the name of the Okinawan set of islands. Um, and so these populations like Native Americans and Native populations worldwide faced discrimination. So many of them left um, Japan to come to the United States hoping for a better life. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out. Uh, the discrimination carried over. Um, the Native or the Japanese immigrant population carried over their discrimination, um, but also so did the, and it passed on to the other immigrant populations as well, who also discriminated against the Ainu and the Ryukyu uh, people. And so they were coming over in the 1890s. And um, one of them was Fusawa Sakaizawa, who came over in the early 1900s, possibly 1904. Uh, he had fled Japan, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, his mother was, um, I know, so he was discriminated against in Japan and had gone to Tokyo to um, hopefully find a better life for himself and got involved with the Methodist church and the Methodist church sent him to uh, California. And so he had actually met a woman who was um, Japanese um, and she had been disowned by her family for marrying somebody who was part Ainu. And the couple uh, also faced discrimination in the US while they lived in California. But interestingly, this did not prevent him from teaching at a Japanese school, for example, or having a role in the Methodist church, which I found really interesting. Um, and so there was, also um, another family, uh, this time of Okinawan, Ryukyu and descent, um, roughly in the 1900s, 1910s, um, Yasuke Araki's Ryukyuan family, like many families, came over from Okinawa to Hawaii and settled in the sugar plantations. Okinawa also has uh, sugar plantations and has a similar climate. Um, and so he uh, has an interesting history with discrimination. So he had a Japanese American girlfriend. Her family didn't like the fact that he was Okinawan. But his mother also didn't want him initially to marry somebody who was Hawaiian. And so it 
took apparently, I think, some persuasion to finally uh, bring his mother around to when he married his Hawaiian white uh, wife in the uh, 1940s during the war. Um, and so there's a lot of discrimination all, all around between uh, various populations. And so another group of native Japanese couples were native Alaskans and Japanese. So native uh, or, or Japanese immigration to Alaska between roughly 1880s and 90s, and a lot of them became fishermen um, and became acquainted with uh, native American women, most of the Tlingit and the Inuit tribes. Um, and so uh, one of the most interesting stories that I found actually fairly recently, um, so around 1897, uh, so uh, Kioske and his um, American name became Frank. So um, that's just what everybody called him in the US. Um, American people would sort of make up names for Japanese immigrants and just call them George or Frank or Harry or uh, what have you. Um, and so had come to Alaska. He had been actually working on a US cutter ship uh, called the Bear, uh, and which has another bit of famous history as well uh, after uh, Fred leaves the service due to discrimination he ends up in a little village called Point Barrow because the cutter got stuck in some ice and they were going to starve and so they sent young Frank who was the youngest member alone some you know several hundred miles to go and find food for them and he said well this is ridiculous you know, I've been discriminated against because I'm Japanese. I'm just going to settle here. So he brought food back and then went back to, to Point Barrow to live and eventually married um, Novello, the chief's daughter, and became fluent in the language and learned the customs and um, realized that life in Point Barrow just was not working for the native community because of disease, starvation, you know, white people were taking away their animals that they needed to live on um, and so forth. And so uh, he goes prospecting, he and Navillo uh, go prospecting with a few other people. And so in um, 18 or 1905, he and Navillo interestingly separately find caches of gold and decide to make a trading post there and named the town Beaver. And so they brought the people from Point Barrow to Beaver to live and created a trading post there. And presumably there was a gold rush on there too, as well, um, and lived out the rest of their lives in Beaver, Alaska. And at the same time, um, there were other people, in, in other couples in other parts of Alaska um, and many of them uh, became very famous within nat uh, native Alaskan history, uh, mostly for, for their efforts on behalf of native Alaskan people. Um, in 1912, Chester Worthington, who was Tlingit, co-founded with several other men. Uh, he's pictured over here on the right. One of these four men, I'm not quite sure which one, co-founded the Native Alaskan Brotherhood, the A. Uh, or the Alaska Native Brotherhood, sorry about that, the ANB, um, which also let women in later, so let became the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood um, to get rights for Native American or Native Alaskans who weren't citizens at the time. And so in 1924, that was finally achieved. And incidentally, that same year, um, his daughter, Mary, married a man named and sources differ on his surname. So it's either Kamaichi or Kameichi known as George uh, Miyasato. And um, this is where it gets a little complicated because the 1907 act is still in effect. So I am not sure whether Mary was granted US citizenship in 1924 and then immediately lost it when she married. Uh, George, or because Alaska wasn't a state, if that did not apply, I have unfortunately not figured that out yet. 
Um, but uh, incidentally, uh, Mary's mother would later remarry uh, to um, James Johnson, who was another A and B co-founder. So both of Mary and George's grandchildren's grandparents were involved in the A and B. Um, and so there was also a lot of native uh, and Japanese intermarriage at the time and a lot of intermarrying because there were also um, white native intermarriages. So many uh, interracial couples were becoming much more diverse. And the native Alaskans were segregated in schools. They went to a different school than I think the, the white kids and the Japanese kids and the native, uh, the native slash Japanese kids were I think sent to the native schools because they were native uh, American or native Alaskan as opposed to the school for Japanese kids. Um, and of course now on to the East Coast. Uh, the East Coast has a little bit of a shorter history, I think, because migration there really didn't start uh, mass migration for a little bit later than the rest of the country. Um, and so the first possibly mixed race person on the East Coast was born in 1870. His name was Nobuteru Harry uh, Sumida. And there's speculation that he may have been mixed, but I haven't found any proof of that either. He, uh, there's been absolutely no record of his parentage, um, but he was adopted by a white couple. And he actually also had an interracial marriage, uh, but his history is absolutely fascinating. He was in the Navy and fought in the 1898 Spanish-American War. He was possibly the only second generation Japanese American known as Nisei uh, to be in the Spanish American war. There may have been some um, immigrant soldiers who were hoping to gain citizenship through um, combat as well as combat in World War I. Unfortunately, the US government reneged on their promise and some of them gained citizenship, but then it got taken away. Um, and so, a few years after the Spanish-American War, um, Harry marries uh, Joanna Schmidt, a white woman, and the couple eventually moves to California around 1841. And the same year that um, Harry and Joanna marry in 1904, a baby was born named Isamu Noguchi, and he was the illegitimate son of an artist named Yone Yonejiro, or Yone for short, Noguchi, and his assistant, Leonie Gilmore. Uh, he was born in California, and the couple had met in New York and then moved to California. Well, Yone abandoned his family and moved back to Japan, and Leonie, with Isamu in tow, went after him and lived in Japan for a while, and then the family came back without Yone, who had remarried to a Japanese woman, uh, to the United States, uh, now comprised of also a daughter, so Isamu's half-sister. Um, and Isamu Noguchi would become a very famous sculptor and architect in New York City, and would also be known for a few other things during World War II. So in the South, there were potentially fewer interracial couples. There's not a lot of documentation about them except through um, census records, uh, marriage records, and so on. Um, and a lot of that story also has not been told until recently. Um, there was a lot of intermarriage between Mexican immigrants, uh, Native Americans, Black Americans, and people of Mexican Native and or Black uh, descent. M many of these families were the children were predominantly Spanish speaking, um, didn't really speak Japanese, interestingly. Um, and so one of the uh, people who is more recently coming to light was a man named Tsujiro Miyazaki. Uh, he had come to the United States after working on a ship. He'd actually worked in France and could speak French a little bit. Um, and 
around the 1820 or thereabouts, land, jumped ship and landed in Virginia and met uh, a woman named spelling differs. So it's either Lethia or Leithia. So with, with or without an A in, in the middle. Um, and Lethia was native and black. And so the couple decide to form a relationship, but not to get married because they believed that their relationship would go against Virginia's 1924 uh, racial integrity law which interestingly, it probably would not have because the racial integrity law seemed to only prohibit marriages between white and other groups. You know, but you were either white or you weren't white and white people couldn't marry non-white people. There weren't, as far as I can tell, and other scholars too, prohibitions against non-white people intermarrying. So they probably could have actually gotten married, but they didn't. Um, and of course, Japanese were not classified as white under this law, though interestingly, um, depending on what sort of laws you were looking at, you know, on, on the bus, they weren't classified as quote unquote colored, so they could sit in the front of the bus. Um, but in some places they were denied service because they weren't white. It's all very complicated, unfortunately. Um, and so they uh, formed a relationship uh, as one of the few Japanese black couples in the South. Um, and all of these couples will have very tragic stories in a couple of decades. Uh, so World War II, everything just uh, goes to pieces for many of these families. So obviously 1941, um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a lot of Japanese American uh, what the government called community leaders. So uh, Japanese American, uh, Japanese school teachers, um, Buddhist priests, um, judo instructors, people who had ties to the Japanese government were rounded up and sent to camps in New Mexico, uh, North Dakota, um, and uh, Idaho, separate from the incarceration camps that the rest of the population on the West Coast was sent to. And so in, on February 19th, 1942, uh, Roosevelt signed the exclusion order that sent West Coast Japanese Americans and a few from other parts of the country um, to assembly centers and then to the, incarc to the, to the 10 incarceration camps. Um, Alaska and Hawaii didn't have um, mass exclusion orders. Alaska sort of did, and the government tried, but it really missed several people. It wasn't quite as thorough as other parts of the country. Uh, California, it was so thorough that it would go through census records to seek out people of Japanese ancestry and arrest people who had no idea that, for example, their, you know, ancestor had been Japanese American or, you know, um, and so I'll get to that in just a second um, in a little bit more detail, but some families were only given 48 hours to dispose of all their belongings um, and incarcerated in camp. Um, and so they would go to these temporary assembly centers and racetracks and fairgrounds living in horse stalls before being sent to the 10 camps in remote, mostly desert areas. Um, and some of them went to Manzanar in California, uh, directly Manzanar was uh, the only camp where you went directly there instead of from usually an assembly center. Um, the rest, the other nine camps, you went directly from an assembly center, um, very rarely directly from your home. Um, so here's a copy of the order on the right. And nowhere actually in this order mentions Japanese Americans. It just sort of happened that way. Um, and so, you know, people, the government was trying to decide what to do with mixed people. And so um, Carl Benditson, who was the wartime civil control administra administrator, said, I am determined that if they have one drop of Japanese blood, they must go to camp. And for all intents and purposes, he got his wish because... 
the <laughs> rules about incarcerating mixed race people are very, very complicated, sexist, confusing. Um, and so in 1942, the government settled on roughly 1 16th Japanese ancestry. So one great, great grandparent. And to put this into perspective, I don't know who my grandmother's, you know, my father's mother's grandparents are. So to, to have people, you know, incarcerated because great, great grandma was Japanese just seems amazing to me that, you know, they figured this out because they went through all the census records and picked 116. Now, this 116th number, I'm not quite sure why they came up with that because it's virtually impossible to have had somebody with 116th Japanese ancestry because even the first uh, immigrants, you know, Kuni's grandkids were in elementary school. So he couldn't have had great grandkids yet. Um, so you would have had to have had an immigrant ancestor coming in like the 1840s to have a great, great grandparent who was of Japanese ancestry. Um, and I haven't actually found anybody who has 116th Japanese ancestry in the camps. Um, so I would be fascinated to know how they figured that out. I've, I've found families with one eighth. Um, so I, I would love to know how they did all of that. Um, and so they were so thorough that they went to orphanages. You know, there was a little boy who was incarcerated in a white orphanage who didn't look Japanese, didn't know he was Japanese. So they picked him up. They picked up kids from foster families um, who, you know, were going to adopt the children, but they said, you're coming too. And they would bring them. Um, they picked, uh, they would separate mixed families. You know, sometimes the mother couldn't go to camp because of illness and the father would go to one camp and the kids would go to the Manzanar Children's Village for orphans um, and all kinds of stories like that through all of my research. Um, and some of the families sort of broke up themselves. You know, there were many instances of the white or mostly white uh, spouse staying outside camp to keep the business going or just deciding not to go um, versus the usually non-white Japanese couples, the non-Japanese spouse would go with them to camp. Um, but then in some cases, the spouse would leave the family. Um, and so the, the usually the dad and the kids would go to camp um, and be separated sometimes permanently from um, their non-Japanese wife slash mother. Um, and so I'm gonna go briefly into what happened to some of these families. Um, so there's not a lot, unfortunately, about what happens to many of these families. Um, I unfortunately haven't gotten to DC yet to look at all these records. Um, so there's very little and a lot of it contradicts what happened to most uh, mixed families. You know, for example, the Yasudas, only Frank went to Minidoka. The rest of his family was allowed to stay home, even the kids. Um, the, and, you know, the Egawas. So they also, a lot of these families incidentally went to Minidoka, uh, which is in Idaho. Uh, so the Egawas, the whole family went and then Grace decided that she wanted to leave camp and she um, took the children with her and he couldn't leave because he was Japan a Japanese male and he you know, wasn't allowed to leave, but the kids were because they were more Americanized and had been living on um, the reservation and were actually members of the Lumi tribe. And you know the Miyazaki uh, family in Virginia um, Suzuro was the only one incarcerated. Uh, he was one of the few from the West Coast, or the, sorry, the East Coast incarcerated. The rest of his family stayed um, at home. And, um, you know, for example, um, the 
Sakai Zawa's, the, the Ainu family, uh, they were all incarcerated and they were not really discriminated against in camp. You know, the kids won all kinds of awards at school. They um, participated in sports. He held lots of positions um, in various boards on the camp. So um, they, they faced a little bit better than some of the other families who faced blatant discrimination from incarcerees um, and ostracism. And um, so another family, the Miyamoto's, George was the only one who would, and his son, who, George Jr. were the only ones sent to camp. George Jr. was a minor and may have gone to camp alone because George Sr. was in one of those um, other detention centers. Uh, he moved around to several before joining George Jr. in camp. So little George was separated not only from his entire family in Alaska, but from his father for some time, it looks like, unfortunately. Um, so despite, again, all of this effort to incarcerate um, Japanese Americans with 1 16th Japanese American heritage, there were some outliers. Uh, people who had been in the Navy uh, or other military service were supposedly exempt but even um, Harry, who had fought in the Spanish-American War and was by then in his 80s, I think, uh, wasn't in exempt. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the Kingi family, who was a Black Japanese family, uh, the father had been in the Navy, so he was exempt, and their family was, but that didn't exempt them from uh, discrimination. They lost their jobs, but they didn't go to camp. Um, the Masamizu family was a fascinating case. Um, Kuni had died in 1915, so it was Carrie, her children, and their grandchildren, who would have been a quarter Japanese. And the FBI came knocking and interrogated Carrie about her life. And they said, well, you don't have to go to camp, but we'll keep an eye on you. And their daughter, Juanita, uh, Wong, who had married a Chinese American man and their children uh, were picked up and taken to an assembly center uh, in Roseville. And the authorities there said, well, wait a minute, you're black. You shouldn't be coming to camp. You, you can go home now. So they sent them home. So they didn't have to go to camp, but the FBI would come around and check on the family. Um, and one possibly the only case of voluntarily entering the camps was Isamu Noguchi, um, the sculptor, who was by then in New York, heard about what was going on and wanted to use art to make life better for the incarcerees. And so he said, well, I'm going to go to camp. Um, so he, they let him in. And he was there for a while. Unfortunately, his plan didn't quite work out because he was born a little bit earlier than most of the first uh, or second generation children. So he was a lot, lot older um, than most. And also being mixed, he really didn't fit in in camp. And so they said, you know, we don't really know, you know, how to interact with you. And he got very discouraged and, you know, said, well, I want to leave now. So because of the mixed marriage policy that allowed certain mixed families to leave camp, he was allowed to go back to New York. And so what did the government do to mixed families? What, you know, there were all kinds of, again, racism, sexism uh, in the rules. So the people who were not allowed to leave camp and return to the West Coast were families with a non-Japanese, um, or the families who were allowed to leave the West, uh, to go back to the West Coast were families with a non-Japanese father, because apparently your father determined your Americanness. And if you had a, uh, a non-Japanese, you know, anywhere from white to Mexican American to, you know, Black American, you were seen as more American. Uh, than if you had a non-Japanese mother. 
And so they were apparently more Americanized. And so you, if you had minor children, you could go back home. If, uh, on the other hand, it was the other way around. You generally couldn't go home except in the case of, you know, certain cases. It got very confusing. And I'm sorry, I can't go into too much detail. That would just be a whole other topic in and of itself. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the families would have to leave people behind. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Japanese father would be left behind while the minor children and the mother would go back home. Um, Families of whatever makeup with adult children couldn't leave and go back home, but they could leave and go elsewhere in the country. Um, families who had a non-Japanese um, background, you know, if they didn't eat Japanese food, they didn't speak Japanese, they, you know, um, those sorts of things, they were more Americanized. So. Um, especially in the case of the father, you know, didn't speak Japanese to their kids or learned another language and spoke that to them. They were seen as more Americanized as well. Um, I still haven't figured out how they came up with all of these rules. I would love to know who decided on all of these. Um, and so a lot of these families were split up. They, they would you know, leave the, usually the dad in camp or the, the non-Japanese mother slash wife would leave um, and so on and so forth. Um, there's all kinds of correspondence between government and camp officials saying, okay, can this person leave? Well, no, they might be non-Japanese in upbringing, but you know, they don't live in a community that's Americanized, quote unquote, Americanized enough. So they can't go back and all kinds of arbitrary rules in each of these letters um, about individual families um, and their circumstances. Um, and so many of the families were allowed to leave, some were not. And so the Igawa's Grace left camp and with the kids, Frank left to go uh, work after he was released from camp and then eventually went back to Washington to rejoin the family. And uh, the Miyazaki, uh, Tsujiro Miyazaki left camp to go and work. And unfortunately he died a few months later and um, his family never saw him again. His sons were about two and three years old. So they don't remember him, unfortunately. And, um, and so the Miyasatos, George Jr. and Sr. Uh, went, eventually back to Alaska um, and the Sakaizawas, um, I'm not quite sure when they left camp because they also moved to a different camp. Uh, there was a lot of that as well, but they did eventually move back home as well. Many of the families did not. Uh, they wanted to prevent discrimination that they had experienced on the West Coast. So they would move to uh, other parts of the country. The government encouraged this because it didn't want clusters again of Japanese populations. They wanted to disperse everybody so that they wouldn't be a large sort of quote unquote Japan town in other parts of the country. Partly they say, I think to mitigate discrimination against Japanese Americans uh, during the war because this was still in the wartime period and post-war periods. Um, and so after the war, um, interracial marriage continues uh, with American GIs and WACs, the Women's Army Corps, uh, who went to Japan during the occupation and worked in, mostly in Tokyo uh, with the occupation government, uh, with MacArthur and so on. And um, many of them, the WACs who went to Japan, as well as the WACs who stayed here, intermarried because they would meet soldiers you know, uh, American soldiers there, and the American soldiers intermarried with Japanese women um, there as well. Uh, both black and white uh, soldiers would uh, form relationships. And there were many, 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 many obstacles. Um, the government strongly discouraged interracial relationships between soldiers and Japanese citizens. Um, you know, fraternizing was sort of okay, you know, it happened. And so the government finally said, all right, let, let's just let them fraternize. And so finally in 1940, uh, 
nine, three years after the first uh, mixed race baby was born in Japan, the government finally said, okay, we'll let you get married, but you have to do all of these things before you can bring your Japanese wife back to the States. And, you know, the paperwork was just onerous. It took a long time. And many of the GIs who were in Japan were fighting in the Korean War. So they couldn't turn in their paperwork on time to get married. And so they missed the deadline. They couldn't get married. Um, and of course, they were also in Korea fighting the war. So they weren't there to do all of these things. And eventually, you know, the government eased restrictions, immigration uh, restrictions on Japanese immigrants as well. And eventually during the 50s, women, uh, Japanese women were allowed to get married. And the white Japanese couples faced a lot less uh, obstacle and discrimination than the black Japanese couples. The black Japanese couples faced discrimination from white soldiers. The commanding officers tried to prevent black men from um, marrying Japanese women. The Japanese women's families were up in arms. The Japanese community was up in arms. You know, they would go back to the United States. And of course, the Japanese American community didn't like it either. You know, they were discriminated against from white Americans, sometimes even black Americans, although usually they found community with the black communities. So they would settle in the black communities and find um, communities and friendships there. And, you know, there, there were a lot of newspaper articles in black newspapers, uh, Ebony Magazine and the Chicago Defender about black Japanese couples, including things like, where can I, which states can I not get married in? Um, you know, where can I live after I get married if my state doesn't allow me to uh, get married? And, you know, experiences of Black Japanese couples and um, news like that, that the white press definitely didn't talk about. So the Black community was a lot more helpful and uh, to these mixed couples and talked a lot about it and gave them um, a community, I think, of their own in a way that the other mixed communities didn't. Um, and so that was a very broad overview of about 100 years of Japanese American mixed race history. Um, and many of the families are now in the last possibly decade. Um, researching their own family histories, which is how I found out all about a lot of this. Um, the Egawas are talking about their Native American uh, heritage and talking about their family's experiences in camp. Um, the Miyazaki's, um, Regina Boone it, her, is talking about her grandfather, Sujiro, and her father and her uncle's experience. Um, and it's, it's actually a fascinating story. There's a wonderful documentary out there too. Um, and the Kingis are talking about their grandfather's experiences in the Navy and how they bought a gravestone for him because he didn't have one at the time. Um, and his grandson's written a book, uh, uh, which is called Pure Winds, Bright Moon, the untold story of the saintly steward and his Hapa family. And um, so the you know, the Miyasato, the grandchildren of the ANB founders are also in the ANB and active in um, teaching about um, native culture, native language and keeping that alive. And the Sakai Zawas are now, you know, proud of their Ainu heritage and have gone back to Japan, to Hokkaido to learn about their family history. Um, and a lot of native Hawaiian Japanese families are saving traditions, um, be it hula dancing, language, lay making, all kinds of cultural practices. Um, and as well as um, Ainu and Ryukyu and families are talking more openly about their experiences as well. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our other panelists. Thank you so much, Sakina. Uh, that was a, a fascinating history that I don't think has been in any history book, or at least not in a way that, that did it justice. So 
can't thank you enough for for sharing your work with us. Yeah. And I hope we find more opportunities to showcase this and uh, so people can learn more about it. Um, so I want to be mindful of everyone uh, spending a lot of time with us online. Uh, maybe we'll take a little break before we get into the panel discussion. Um, maybe let's say four minutes so we can get back at 510. And we'll see you all soon. Uh, go take care of whatever you have to take care of. Bailey, could you please, there you go, thank you. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, we, we just heard this excellent background uh, history that Selena has provided, and now we wanted to take uh, a bit of a closer look into the lives of some uh, mixed race Japanese American individuals and see kind of how their experiences might fit in or perhaps don't fit in, uh, and just learn a little more about uh, some of the human connections. So I think since we're waiting on Zada, let's go ahead and start with Aino. Um, so I can read your bio really quick. Um, Aino Nixon is a meditation artist who combines the creative mediums of writing, music, and art with the healing movements of meditation, yoga, and tai chi to express spirit. She creates and teaches in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Aino received her middle name from her ok Okinawan mother and her first name, Catherine, from her African-American father's mother. Ayano and her siblings traveled and lived in Japan and Germany with their military parents before her family finals finally settled in New Mexico. So welcome, Ayano. Um, I was wondering if there's anything else uh, beyond what was in your bio that you would like to share about your personal or family history with us. Um, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Selena. That was... Awesome. <laughs> okay. And um, so just continue. It's like a continuation of the story because my parents met uh, like around 1956. I was born in 1957 and they met in Okinawa. My dad was a Marine um, stationed there. And um, yeah, so anyway, they uh, might, you know, my mom worked in a laundry they didn't my dad didn't speak Japanese my mom didn't speak um English but they got together somehow and they wanted to get married and just like Selena said you know he went to his CEO and he said you know I want to you know marry this woman and he said uh Nixon if the Marines had wanted you to have a wife we would have issued you a wife and so that became the beginning of the uh, paperwork, you know, the paperwork that lasted like a year. And, um, but then they, they did get married and uh, my dad stayed in the military. So um, our experience might be a little different because my dad was in the military. And so you can kind of see maybe a little bit of an improvement um, uh, because, you know, they were allowed to get married and we lived with we lived under like a military law situation you know so everybody was kind of equal i mean the rules were supposed to be the same for everybody um and we traveled and we went to different places um as you said there was still racism you know but we just kind of you know managed and did well i think as, as best we can so uh, I came to Minnesota and I was a lawyer for a while and then I was a public school teacher for a while. So for myself personally, um, uh, having people look at me and, and kind of define me based on what they could see or, or not able to define me based on what they could see because they're like not sure that I fit in any category, it over time has become important to me to um, develop my inner independence and inner life. And so I've always been an artist, even when I was working as a lawyer and a teacher. Um, so now I just use my art to uh, kind of keep developing that uh, inner independence, uh, which I think is very important ultimately for all of us. Um, 
kind of foundational. And I think that's it <laughs> for myself. Well, thank you, I know. And we're, we're looking forward to learning more about you and, and your story as, as the conversation progresses. Okay. Uh, so let me go ahead and introduce our last panelist, uh, Zada Espinoza. Um, Zada is a queer, non-binary, multiracial, ethnic, cultural wonder woman of Latino, Asian American heritages and a Jedi justice, equity, diversity and inclusion strategist uh, known for their intersectional thought leadership that is informed by their unique life experiences and holistically human approach to people, culture, and community work in global tech, corporate, and nonprofit organizations. As an LGBTQ plus changemaker, Zada was the first femme non-binary person of the Chicago leadership team in the global nonprofit Out in Tech. Uh, Zada also served over 10 years of leadership in international affairs with the Japan Exchange in Teaching, or JET, program and has worked with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Suda for Solidarity, Nikkei Uprising, National Nikkei Reparations Coalition, NNRC, uh, Okaity LGBTQ plus Nikkei Community, National Diversity Council, Latinas in Tech, Black Tech Jobs, and more. Uh, so very excited uh, to have Zada with us. You can see we have an all-star cast here for all of you. Um, so Zada, I would like to ask you the, the same question. Beyond what we see there in your bio, is there anything you would like to share with us about your personal or family history? Um, well, I mean, many things, and I'm sure it will get sprinkled and um, seasoned uh, throughout this entire conversation. But I just want to thank um, the Twin Cities of uh, the JCL, Japanese American Citizens League, Sudo for Solidarity, Minnesota, and also the Eastside Freedom Library for having me and my other fellow speakers and ASL interpreters um, today. I really appreciate it. Um, this is so surreal because I never thought that I'd be in conversation and meet so many people, not just about the stories about being mixed race, but let alone mixed Nikkei. And along with being in community with people, not just physically, but virtually, but spiritually as well, and all the amazing force that we are. Um, I guess like just to, for like little starters, things from like my personal or family history, like I have many pronouns, as you noticed, um, they, them, L, Zizer, which are neo pronouns, or she, her. Um, so you have lots to choose from. I do ask that you choose one that challenges you because being non binary means I don't necessarily you know, go for the binary terms of male or female. I am on the spectrum. And for my fellow queer folks and accomplices or allies, um, happy Pride Month. Pride is all year. And so I'm wearing. Um, like I wanted to wear stuff that represented my cultures, both with my Mexican heritage. My father was of Mexican American descent, I think second generation, along with um, you know my uh, my lay here that is from Hawaii. Actually, I got through um, my chosen mother, uh, Marsha Izumi, who is one of the founders of Okaidi Nikkei LGBTQ, and then of course my Wonder Woman symbol. And the reason why I identify as a Wonder Woman, despite being non-binary, is because growing up. I never really saw superheroes as that looked like me, um, besides Storm, but I'm not Black. Um, but even then, I still love Storm and the X-Men. X-Men was like the first ever comic that really demonstrated a marginalized community to me um, on paper and validated me. So really love them, plus 90s kid. Uh, definitely love the X-Men cartoon. Um, and with that, when I saw Wonder Woman, Linda Carter of the 70s, I thought she was me because she was uh, you know, she exhibited masculine and feminine qualities, both visually and, you know, um, mentally and emotionally. She is actually of Latino descent. She's also a mixed race person. So when I saw her and I'm like, wow, if that's what femme or women folk can be and everything else and more, then that must be me. And so I love Wonder Woman. I even have a, a cosplay costume my father helped me make um, out of cereal boxes, sponge paint, and found materials. Um, I don't wear it as much now at Comic-Cons because it's so fragile. And my father, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but it's something with him I honor through my Mexican culture with my hand embroidery dress on that I have today and my earrings from Mexico. Um, with that, my multiracialism just doesn't go to my father's heritage because I'm also, as Vinny, I think, said in my bio, I am adopted. So I was adopted from Seoul, South Korea at three months. So I don't remember a thing y'all don't, <laughs> like I don't remember anything. Um, and with that, you know, my father is Mexican American and he's very dark skinned. Um, many people, when I went and worked abroad in Japan, when I showed a picture thought he was Obama. That is how 
dark skinned he is and how problematic that assumption was, along with my mother is white. They thought she was Hillary Clinton. Uh, a lot of my Japanese friends and students, um, problematic, but I laugh at it right now just to cope with that. Um, so, but with that, I was a late bloomer and really knowing about my family history and about my multiracialness, though I've had to embrace it my whole life, um, that I always thought I was Korean up until I was sweet 16 when I found out I was of Japanese descent on my biological mother's side through birth records. And so with that, you know, I just consider myself like quad racial, multiracial, multicultural. And it's something for me where, you know, along with being queer, it's it's just so complex. And that idea of like not being enough has always been something that has plagued me, especially not just from the multiracialness I have, but also I grew up in the in the Midwest, um, all the way in Michigan, uh, west side of Michigan, but I'm located in Chicago now, very homogenous, very white. And for me, you know, growing up there, you know, we weren't rich, we didn't have a lot of money. And there's just so many intersections that have collided that have put into my notion of enoughness. But when it comes to just being of my many mixed multitudes, as I say, is that just because I don't feel enough of anything, that could also mean that I'm enough of everything and that I am more and not less um, of my multiracialness, but I'm happy to get into more um, of the nuances of that through this conversation. Thank you so much, Sada. And uh, Selena, I also want to make sure we, we learn a bit, little bit about your history. You've already shared with us on the, the kind of more American history, but is there anything you would like to share with us about your uh, personal or family history? Um, well, I, contrary to my research, am half white, uh, half Japanese, um, and my mother is a Shin Ise, so uh, for the interpreter, S H I N Ise, I S S E I, uh, meaning that she was born and came over post war, um, as opposed to everybody who has, I don't know, six, seven generations by now uh, in Japanese American history. Um, and, you know, most of my friends are mixed white Japanese. So having this broader community is a really new thing for me too. Um, and I'm grateful to everybody for their support, their wisdom, their stories. And it's been an amazing experience. Thank you so much. It's really special to be sharing this space with all of you. And I see that uh, Zara has started the trend of sharing uh, contact information in the chat. So uh, by all means, the rest of you panelists, if you're comfortable with that and you would like to help the wonderful folks in our audience be able to reach out to you, please go ahead and share any website or contact information you would like to put and we can keep the conversations going uh, beyond the time we have here today. Um, but on that note, I have a couple of questions here that uh, we can talk about. Uh, I'd also welcome questions from the audience, but we definitely won't have time to get to everything. So we'll kind of see where the conversation goes, and I'll, I'll try to keep us uh, moving through a couple of different topics as, as we can. So the, the first question I have, uh, it could be for any anyone in the on the panel, uh, whoever would like to take it. So the question is, uh, there's so much historical emphasis on how various racial groups don't get along. Um, Actually, let me go ahead and copy this into the chat to help. Uh, there's so much emphasis on how various racial groups don't get along, but there's actually a lot of camaraderie and solidarity that continues today. Obviously, we are all uh, products of that. So is there any other example of cross-racial solidarity that is personally impactful to you? I'll start. Um, this is Zara, <laughs> by the way. Um, yeah, this is Zara, by the way. So of course, like some of the more popular, maybe well-known tropes to people would be like Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X, Grace Lee Boggs and her husband, James Bogg, who opened up one a big school, we're a multiracial couple um, who opened up a school in Detroit, Michigan. Again, proud Michigander here. But one thing of like cross-racial solidarity, it's a bit more um, closer to home to me, it was done actually through some of my work with the JET program. And um, so if anybody's familiar with the JET program, it's a Japan exchange and teaching program. It's not an exchange student program, but it's one of the longest running grassroots cultural exchange programs 
um, in the world. It's involvement with not just the United States, but also like, I think now over 40 or 50 other countries. It was my first job outside of college was going over to Japan. I had never been to Japan before, um, not just to teach English, but to be a cultural ambassador. And with that, I met a myriad of people from all over the world. Um, and I mean, that's a whole nother story in itself. It was actually the time that I first ever learned of the word Nikkei. I met another Japanese American who was on the program with me and I was really struggling with understanding my Japanese-ness because I, I thought I was Mexican. Um, so like for me, and then I never identified much with my whiteness though there's some complexities because being adopted, I know my brown father could probably never adopt um, an international child, especially without probably my white mother. But that aside, when I was on jet, I heard of Nikkei for my first time through someone who is a more coastal West Coast Nikkei or Japanese American person. With that, I stayed involved with the program even after I lived in Japan and worked on it and came become part of the Jet Alumni Association. And I had the honor of like onboarding now over a thousand people onto the program. And one of these people was Deontay Deuce Griggs. He is a black African-American man who um, helped send on the program back in 2013. When Black Lives Matter uprising happened after George Floyd's murder in 20, May 2020, um, he became, Deontay became, or Deuce became the first, or one of the organizers uh, organized the first peaceful march in protest in Japan of Black Lives Matter. What makes this relevant to us here in America is Deontay is an American, or Deuce, he likes being called, Deuce is an American. And many other, not just Japanese and Black people in Japan, like where maybe we were born in Japan, became part of the Solidarity March and March for um, the protest or peaceful march um, to support Black Lives Matter but also, you know, many people from America were, and many of them are of mixed race descent. Also monoracial people were involved in it too. And to me, I had the honor of last, or in 2020, August 2020, of honoring his work and highlighting it. I'll put the program in the chat a link to it. Um, but that's something where I really, that makes a big deal for me because it's something that's impacting more than just America, but still relevant to us here in America about that we can make a difference um, and our voices can be heard, not just through the love of technology and the use of technology, but just our willingness to continue to fight and to advocate for freedom of all people, not just some. Um, let's see, I, uh, well, since I grew up in the military, we traveled a lot, but um, even further back, I would just say just you know, we kind of have to, um, cross, you know, have relationships with <laughs> lots of people from different cultures because kind of a small group, the mixed race is, you know, um, uh, mis mixed race, Japanese, Black American. But um, um, I want to, you know, say that like the military, you know, it's got issues, of course, but uh, you know, soldiers being together and having being in it together, they kind of have to uh, find ways to get along. Um, and then when we go to other countries, while well, we were living in other countries like Germany and Japan, we had to get along. Um, well, it wasn't hard. People were nice, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, I'll go back even further to when I was eight years old. We lived on Yokota Air Base. And um, uh, I wanted to enter the talent contest at the NCO club. Yokota Air Base is uh, near Tokyo, I think. It's very uh, big. And so, uh, but I entered the contest. And I, I danced a ballet dance uh, to, as time goes by, my parents helped me put get it together. And uh, I won, you know, in those days they had like first prize for the girls and first prize for the boys. But you know, I won and, you know, it was a mixed group, but it was mostly white people. But, uh, you know, I kind of felt like I was supported by that military community as a little uh, girl of color, you know, who, who just wanted to, you know, do something and I, I was rewarded for it. So that's just kind of like a small thing. And every day, I think, you know, when you're interacting with people and, and they're considerate and they're listening and um, so it goes from the small to the big, like the George Floyd protests, and you can see all over the world that people are, are working together, but from the small, you know, just like, you know, just meeting a person of a different uh, cultural background here in New Mexico, um, uh, Mexican American or uh, Native American, and, and just, 
you know, just being human together. So. Is there anything you'd like to add on, on this question or we can move on to the next one, up to you. Just briefly that things like um, the Japanese American pilgrimages and the, what does, um, and the Japanese American National Museum and all these organizations are expanding the story to include mixed race, Japanese Americans. Um, unfortunately, there's a long way to go yet to do that because not all of these organizations are willing to do that um, yet or they're only expanding it a little bit. But the fact that that's there and the camps, for example, um, talk in solidarity with the Muslim community, with the Black community has been really heartwarming to me. Um, but we just need to get everybody on board and to actually <laughs> do, do the things that they keep saying that they will. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Sandy. You gotta hold people accountable. And in the words of this black semantic uh, practitioner that I really admire, Prentice Hempel, um, they say that accountability is how we live in relation to each other. So we definitely have to stay vigilant no matter what and how we identify. Um, one quick other example I wanted to mention that's very relevant potentially to a lot of people in this room, um, and of course myself, is uh, for cross-racial solidarity that we're living through the history right now is with HR 40 and Black reparations, especially when it comes to the Nikkei and Japanese American community. I wanna give a shout out to the amazing Cassie Ma Kathy Masuoka. Um, she was one of the JAs or Japanese American people who testified on behalf of Black reparations, bringing in the history of Japanese Americans. She is 73 and a badass, y'all. Um, but I have, I'll put a link in the chat to her testimony that was really powerful, that was broadcasted. Um, and as well as she is a part, I've had the honor of working with her in um, the NNRC, which is the National Nikkei Reparations Coalition that is active right now and also um, doing things as well. I had the honor of being on a or being part of a panel with even Yuri Kochiyama's, I think, great granddaughter, Akemi Kochiyama on there. And we've been pushing um, to fight for black reparations because when it gets down to it, whether you're Japanese, Asian American, everything in between, like a lot of the civil rights movement for black freedom, you know, really inspired a lot of freedom for other peoples of color and races. So it's one of the things where like we, as Grace Lee Boggs said, like the only way we survive is taking care of each other. And I just really appreciate not just the work that Kathy and the NNRC is doing, which is a coalition of various Nikkei organizations, but how we partner with organizations of other racial um, identities and more. Um, actually on that note, I, uh, since you're connecting it to kind of what's going on nowadays and some of the legal and political advocacy that our communities are doing to support each other. I think it might be good for uh, to ask this question that, that uh, we had been talking about before. So as some of you may know, uh, today is Loving's Day, which is the uh, 55th anniversary of the US Supreme Court's uh, Loving versus Virginia decision uh, way back in 1967. And that was the uh, Supreme Court decision that finally made interracial marriage legal uh, throughout the US. Uh, prior to that, it had been a state by state kind of deal. Um, so we've seen the Supreme Court in the news quite a bit these days with some of their historical decisions um, potentially coming under threat and potentially uh, that having repercussions for Americans and some of the rights that we have come to enjoy uh, being challenged. So I was wondering if anyone on the, in the panel uh, has any thoughts or, or if you've heard anything about uh, how the loving decision might also be under threat or, or you know, maybe it's okay. Um, well, I haven't heard anything, but it doesn't seem like it's a priority right now for uh, people. It seems like, you know, gay marriage might be more, you know, in trouble, but you know, I don't know exactly how. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's there are a lot of a lot of interracial marriages now, like in the United States, all over the world. I I just I don't think they're going to go there. I don't think they will. But you know, 
I'm sure that, you know, if people want, really, they can find a way. I don't think the Supreme Court will do it, though. No. Fingers crossed for sure. And anybody else at it? I want to respectfully disagree. <laughs> because I smell a stun. I smell a stun, y'all. Like, I mean, I, I respectfully disagree and agree with you, Ayana. Like, when it gets down to it, like even gay marriage and you know, abortion now, even and all that stuff is, you know, it, it can vary state by state. Like with great freedoms come great responsibility, right? Let me change the famous <laughs> quote. Um, but with that, like especially with the, you know, the leaked draft opinion of Roe versus Wade um, being brought out, like, even though, I mean, again, like, white supremacy and oppression is insidious. And it's, um, it one of my colleagues, one of my colleagues from Out in Tech once said, it's a known white supremacy, a known carcinogen. Uh, and <laughs> with that, like, as I said, like, I smell a stunt in the sense of, I very much think that especially with Roe versus Wade, something that has been the law of the land for a while that has granted so many free, reproductive and humanized freedoms to people, which it just is appalling to me that it's even up for debate um, when it comes to being a human. But I recently um, found a great source, I'll put it in the chat, is um, this podcast by the ACLU. And there's this amazing lawyer named Dr. Michelle Goodwin, who is a constitutional law scholar. Um, and she's a black woman married to a white man. And she's an author of po uh, Policing the Womb. Um, she said in there that she needs to, we need a reproductive justice 2.0 and the need um, for a reproductive justice new deal. And people are like, well, what does this have to do with loving versus Virginia and interracial marriage and mixed oh. race people, right? I thought. And for me, and also listening to this podcast, uh, Dr. Goodwin says that, you know, the loving day, loving versus Virginia, like that victory we've had is it, you wanna get comfortable in it, right? Cause like, yes. We have many people, you know, equality of gay marriage. Yes, but it's not so much about like the laws that are granted and made. It's about how they're like implemented and instilled too. And mm -hmm. she says, one of the quotes I want to bring out from that is, woman must not look at the law is, as it is written, but how it is applied. Because mm -hmm. even with gay marriage being, you know, SCOTUS like, granting it, gay couples are still getting restricted to get a wedding cake. Or birthday mm -hmm. cakes, even probably. I bet you somebody's pulling again a stunt somewhere. Mm -hmm. And abortion rights. And I mean, even my, even though my father and my mother, you know, you would think back in like, you know, the 1970s when they got married, that you know, this wouldn't be a thing. But I just remember my white grandfather telling my mom that he can't believe that she married an S-word, um, a racial surf for a Mexican person, um, on there. And then when he when she decided to adopt two kids from Korea, um, my grandpa, who is a Korean War vet, was also like, how can you adopt sandbags too? So like, even though it wasn't against the law to get married or to adopt, you know, interracial children and have an interracial spouse, how it's applied. And so that's deep, deep within our society. And one more thing I wanted to reference from that podcast is that Loving Day is all tied into, you know, gay marriage, you know, we're persuade all our rights as human beings, not just civil liberties, but rights as human beings, because interracial and being mixed and multiracial, multi anything is like a, it's a story of our wholeness, Dr. Goodwin says. And it's about having us having the right and the freedom to choose. And if America really is the land of the free, then what's the problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> so as much as I agree with you that like, you know, there'll always be somewhere I think and hope that would allow families of any races and multiple intersections to unite and be married and people to choose who to love, no matter if it's the gender, no matter if it's your race or anything else, that still could go away. So I do really think we need to remain vigilant because even within the bleak draft of Roe versus Wade, there's Amy Comey Barrett alluded to adoption being the solution to anti-abortionists, which is very wrong, very violent as coming from an adoptee right here. And it also alludes to some past course cases that tie into eugenics, into like mis oh. insemination laws. So it's insidious. So read the fine print and between the lines. Not you, I'm talking to everyone. No, 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 no. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know, Selena, do you, me, me and Ayano have been talking. Selena, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I think you're right. I mean, as long as there are people that want to control other people and impose their 
moral values on or they're, they're going to try to find ways to do it i i think it's yeah i think it's it's possible yeah it's possible i mean the so statutes, that's why we have to keep like making sure it doesn't happen <laughs> the statutes are still on the books i mean states still have these laws even if they don't enforce them and i'm just oh, gonna really say, yeah oh okay and i think I'll have to double check or unless within oh, the last. So no one's challenged them. So they're still they, like. They might have taken them off yeah. the books within the last, I don't know, even five, 10 years. They finally took them off. But I'm just going to assume they're all going to go away because I'm a pessimist and hope that I'm wrong. <laughs> so we've got. No, Ken, that was a Ken good Tim. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, we've got Kent in the chat saying that the laws are still on the books. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so we got a question from the audience here. Uh, Lee Gray is asking, what do you do to honor both parts of your heritage, or perhaps more than more than two parts? Well, I'm always learning Japanese <laughs> to get closer because I don't speak it now. Um, like my brother lives in Japan and he speaks it, but, um, yeah. And, um, you know, well, we live in the United States, so it's easier with the, um, African-American side, you know, just, I don't know. It's just all around. So yeah, it's just staying in touch with family and friends and history, current events. <laughs> I mean, right now is a way how I honor both parts of my heritage, being part of these conversations, yeah. being seen. Um, and, you know, not just, and being seen can look different ways. Like this, this pandemic has really taught me that I'm not an extrovert. My extrovertism became something because of capitalism and how America praises extrovertism. I'm an amnivert. Um, but with that, like, you know, I've, I've immersed myself in books. I have immersed myself in not just books about my cultural heritage, but books about other people's cultural heritages. I try to, like, I mean, as a multiracial per person, and I think just as a human in general, like, I've just got, for me, I've gotten used, like, discomfort is my norm. And so I'm so used to it to the point where, you know, I try to, like, revel in it. Where like for me, you know, I can look at something and be like, well, that's not something I agree with. Like, especially being raised uh, Latino, it's very traditional because of col Spanish colonial colonialism that a lot of like Mexican Americans are Catholic. And even though I grew up Catholic and don't practice it anymore, you know, I've become curious about Buddhism, um, not just because of my Japanese and Korean identities, but also I'm curious about like other religions, like remaining curious is something of how I celebrate not just my cultural heritage, but others. And through that, I actually learn more about myself. Like when I moved to Japan, it was interesting of how I felt more American than ever moving to one of my birth countries. <laughs> that was weird. Um, and then it's funny of how in America, I don't feel very American. I feel more Japanese or Japanese American than ever or Mexican or Mexican American. So besides like just wearing and dressing things, it's just putting, putting into practice my love, not just for my cultures and others, but for myself is how I celebrate it. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about feeling more American when you uh, are in another country. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's some, you're very proud. Like when we we're in the military, especially, it was really nice to be American. Uh, and one of the reasons was because of the diversity. Um, uh, I was an exchange student to Sweden in my senior year of high school. And so that's a different culture too. And, um, but I was really proud to be an American there because, you know, I'm an American too. I mean, I'm an American too. I don't look like you, but, but, you know, and, and then American art, uh, movies and, uh, uh, yeah, American culture there's just a lot of good stuff that comes out of a diversity of people. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if anyone else has anything to add, there's also a uh, supplemental question that we got in the chat from 
um, I apologize if I mispronounce this, Julianne or Giuliani perhaps, um, Shibata has asked, uh, has this honoring gotten any easier as you've gotten older? Or perhaps has there been any change in how you identify or honor these, these different backgrounds? It's, I've struggled with being Japanese. Um, you know, I, when I was in Houston, where I was born, I went to Japanese school on Saturdays and everybody who was mixed basically looked like me. And so, you know, I didn't really think of myself as Japanese. I really wasn't aware that I was, you know, just, just something that everybody did. And then I moved to Japan and I it was the first time I had a class full of kids who didn't really look like me. You know, everybody there was monoracially Japanese, although there was one Korean, half Korean girl, but they all looked the same. You know, I didn't. Uh, the kids made it very clear that I was not one of them. And then I moved back to the States to basically, you know, wasp capital USA in the Midwest here. Um, and, you know, also attended Japanese school. In Japanese school, you didn't talk about stuff that was hard, stuff that was bad, you know, so I didn't really have that outlet. And so it's only when within the last few years finding communities like this that I've really been able to talk about the issues of identity and self-loathing and all of that. Um, so, you know, the honoring was kind of forced on me. <laughs> I didn't really, you know, <laughs> care about wanting to be Japanese. I didn't want to be. Um, I mean, there are, I, I like a lot of it, the food, you know, the, the community that I have that I wouldn't have had otherwise, you know, my white friends obviously wouldn't understand any of this, um, the way that my Japanese American friends have, but it, it, it's been hard and it's been so nice to have a community who gets that finally, <laughs> where have you been all of my life? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Diana, or is something coming to mind for you as a guy who's oh oh okay. um yeah so oh yeah as I get older of course like when I was growing up it was kind of it was the um let's try to blend in and let's just try to be part of the 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 greater society and you know let's not talk about it and just you know try to carry on in spite of everything and and it's it is nice that you know over time we can talk about things and I've discovered so many things. Um, yeah. That helped me to, you, you mentioned that phrase self-loathing and, and you don't know that you feel that way, but you kind of feel that way because you're not fitting in somehow, you know, but then, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize that, Hey, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> And um, yeah, so as I get older, it is much easier to start honoring my uh, ancestors, my my parents and and um, where they came from, and then honoring myself too. So yeah, no, thank you both of you for sharing that. Um, for me being an elder millennial, um, and I just think anybody of marginalized classes or experiences, if you age, aging is a privilege. I found this out when um, two years ago, it was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, which was a big part of gay and queer liberation. And I tried to find people who were black, indigenous and or people of color who were alive during that time. And I couldn't find anybody because many of them had died due to the AIDS epidemic and you know not being able to get um, medication or care because of, you know, being discriminated against because of her race or class and all the other many identity intersections that make us rich and who we are. But back to like, as I get older, I, I try to embrace aging and aging, like, again, like can come with more responsibility. As I've gotten older, I've, I've realized the hard truth that we or I can participate in my own and others oppression. And like growing up and not just a multiracial family, both not like, cause I, I had to deal with, like, I felt like a secret was hidden from me um, when I found out I was Japanese. I also was relieved that I was Japanese because I got teased a lot. Even when I went to a Korean culture camp, everyone's just like, you don't look full Korean. 
And these are from people who are supposed to be my people. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Kinfolk, skin folk aren't always kin folk. I forget who said that. Those are not my words, but I agree with them wholeheartedly. And even with my mother, though she loves me dearly and I love her too. Um, you know, I'm a pro- realizing that I am a product of her whiteness to an extent. And whiteness, not just because of her skin tone, it's about her privilege. It's about her, the concept of whiteness. And especially after living abroad, finding out what whiteness means to other people, like from skin tone to your class, how much money you have, your education, and being part of these systems, it's been really hard to grapple with because the older I feel, the more doomed I feel. Um, but with that, there's a lot of hope as like abolitionist Marian Kaba says, hope is a discipline. Like as I've gotten older, it's become easier to seek hope in the extent. And I will give a lot of that to technology because if it wasn't for technology and with us going more virtual because of this unfortunate pandemic, I would not be here speaking to y'all today. I didn't find my JA or Nikkei community truly until things went virtual because my first JA event in the Midwest was really discriminatory, like straight up. Like the first time I went there, I didn't think I was going to get asked like, you know, what are you? But that was the first question I was asked by other people who share an identity intersection of mine. We're not just Japanese people or Japanese American because I didn't know what say I was, what generation I was. I guess I'm Shin Issei, but, and again, I honor that, you know, being like, like Yonsei, Nisei, et cetera, is a big part of Japanese American and Nikkei and also just Asian American and also immigrant heritages. And I'm an immigrant. I also am a little bamboozled, honestly, about like us, especially JA and Japanese American people always associating us about how long we've been away from Japan. And right there, I feel like there's a layer of trauma in that because a lot of us came here, not, you know, some of us, especially me, didn't, came here against my will. Like some people can organize that, you know, adoption is part of human trafficking. Um, and so with that, as I've gotten older, it's been easier to have to really exercise my own agency, but I've had to, again, remain vigilant about it. Being Looking like I am, people put that model minority myth and that American dream myth of being an immigrant and someone who looks East Asian, but I keep wearing and, you know, as my cousin would say, like my chola makeup, if I want, like that she taught me how to put on, like I keep wearing, not just on the outside, but also inside of my soul, my Latine, my Asian, my Japanese, my Korean, my Americanness in a way that empowers and gives me agency and helps inspire others. And so that's, that's what's helped getting older and also having the agency to choose, choose your family, to choose your people um, and not feel stuck. So something that, that has stood out from all of your narratives and uh, so the history that Selena gave us as well is this kind of overarching theme of the influence of war and militarism, where you know a lot of the effects on, on people's lives, even if you're not directly affected by war and violence, it, it has affected the movement of populations and some of the legislation and foreign policy. Um, so any, is there anything else on that topic that hasn't come up yet in our discussion that anyone would like to uh, bring up more directly? I know war is a terrible, terrible thing, but um, I suppose like the other side of it, <laughs> you shouldn't have a war just because, to have the other side of it, but is that people do end up coming together uh to make the reparations uh or try to work things out and uh i don't know it just seems like it's like in my case it's almost like because of a war you know it came to be it's like you know it's like because of this conflict people actually got together somehow it's not good but it's just um, something that happened. Selena, did you have thoughts? I know I've been talking a lot, so I'm happy to go after you. (laughs) I will let you two talk about this one. I'm not quite. (laughs) Um, yeah. All right. Well, if you want to add anything, feel free to, to, to stop. Feel, I give you permission. Okay. To <laughs> <laughs> but with that, you know, um, I was 
you know, in my doom scrolling of YouTube one night and, <laughs> and, you know, being somebody who was a late bloomer about finding and investing and in learning about my Asian American and multiracial heritage in a more formal sense, especially Japanese and Nikkei heritage. I came across a video um, put on by like PBS, um, a, a sector of PBS called Are Asians the Next in Line to be White? And I'm just like, hmm, because a story that I hear from a lot of other immigrants, especially Asian Americans, um, and also people who are military, um, affected by military and war, I think we all three of us, many of us on this call have been connected, especially if you're identified as American to militarism and war. Um, they quoted uh, Kathy Park Han, who is a Korean American uh, author of Minor Feelings. I highly recommend the book, especially for those who also embrace their righteous rage like me, um, is, you know, her quote was disappear like was uh, her quote was when I hear the phrase Asian Americans are next to be white, I replace the word with disappear. Oh. Asian Americans are in line next to disappear. Mm -hmm. And again, like it's it's hard to hear that because the woman who raised me is white. I had a white mommy, y'all. And with that, I love her dearly and I love her so much. But it's also one of the things where I'm blessed that my multiracial family allowed me to talk about race all the time because we had to like that's something I'm really proud of that my family despite you know we all have dysfunction really was hammered in but there's we're more than just our race you know like as I said like my my great-grandfather on my mother's side my white grandfather because of how he was impacted by war that's that he held these opinions and his white privilege but also his his white trauma um you know and also like just down to it I was adopted because of the war. I'm adopted also because of patriarchy, like them or female or women, like or female identifying babies or assigned birth at birth babies weren't as valuable as, as male. And so with that, it's just like, it, it makes me so angry about like the impact of war and how it's still prevalent now, even in Europe and it's impacting the rest of the world. And it, it ha ha led me to dive into like eugenics and how like, you know, you the, like you know things people can be restricted and engineered to be perfect through you know restrictions and sterilizations and it's one of the things where for me when it comes to like relating my proximity to war and the impact it's had on me and militarism it's that's one of the reasons again like I, when I was talking with you know loving day remaining vigilant and remaining learning about this not just about history but how it's affecting the now mm -hmm. I'm jealous your family talks about it. Mine doesn't. Uh, <laughs> Ever. Aww. Well, I mean, a lot of people would just be like, so your dad is dark skinned Mexican or like Mexican. Your mom is Asian. Like a lot of people would just assume my mom was like a war bride or something. I'm like, no, my mom's white. And they're like, how did that happen? And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, oh dear. Um, swipe left, please. <laughs> but we, I mean, we, we talked about race. But again, that was one thing I wish my family did was like that we are more than just that single story. And even within that single story, there's multiple stories. And that, you know, two or more truths can be true at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. so, but we're talking about it now. So I'm, I'm very happy about that, even though I know we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, looks like we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, I, I can't thank you all enough for being a part of this day here today and, and sharing just a, a little bit of your experience and passions and work. And I, I really hope we get a chance to continue these conversations as we move forward. Um, but to, to close us out, I, I wanted to ask each of you, uh, what gives you hope or excites you about being a mixed Nikkei person today or in the future? It's for me, it's just seeing all these uh, wonderful, you know, mixed Nike and um, mixed people just, you know, being and accomplishing and um, doing great. So, you know, not superior, not inferior, but, you know, just right. <laughs> That we can finally talk about it and have this community you know for example the war brides who came back they buried their japanese-ness you know they spoke english they didn't teach their kids for the most part japanese um you know the immigrant generations before them didn't really 
but just to have a community that appreciates its heritage, appreciates the complexities and the dualities and all the conflicts that come with being mixed race of whatever background and have that community. Well, I, and I, I just want to say specifically like today, like um, listening to Selena and Zara and Vinny and looking at the chats and um, yeah, that gives me hope because yeah, we've gathered together and we're talking about it and doing things and doing things. So, oh, I agree. Like this is this is why I keep showing up despite being tired. I, I'm sure many of y'all are tired. We're in 2020 <laughs> part three or 2022, <laughs> especially in this ongoing global pandemic. Like on the first spectrum of like what gives me hope is is this is everyone in this room both virtually and you know in real time or listening or on video it gives me hope because these spaces were never here before when i grew up i always had to choose are you korean are you japanese are you american or are you an immigrant like adopted immigrant are you mexican or are you white or what are you that's such a triggering <laughs> word for us um bipoc folks especially asian americans and but it's not a zero sum game, right? It's one of those things, what gives me hope is that language is evolving. It's evolving. Like, and again, as language evolves, it's also being oppressed. That doesn't give me hope, but I mentioned that because again, we need to stay vigilant and hold each other accountable from like the don't say gay bill. Like growing up in like the nineties, gay used to mean, um, you know, like stupid along with like someone who likes uh, um, uh, usually a uh, cisgender male who likes other cisgender males. Now it means something different. Now we've evolved to queer. Now there's so many other things to describe on. Like, we're not just mixed race, we're multiracial. Like, I'm just, I'm hopeful with the evolution of language because people are putting things into practice. Like, even now to Spanish, my, my Spanish is very minimal, but I never really identified with Latina or Latino because, you know, Spanish being a colonized language from Spain, like, it just, I, I didn't identify with the more masculine form or it being the default as it is in Spanish and or the feminine form. Now there's Latine, which to me is what I embrace the most. And there's also Latinx. However, Latinx is, you know, an American origin word and something that was maybe not created by actual Latine people. But I'm hopeful for the, the evolution of language. And what excites me is that we're not done yet. I can't wait till the words diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice are not something that I need to say so explicitly all the time. I can't wait till it is embedded. I can't wait till it is salt, pepper, again, calling from the first thing I said, and seasoned into everything that we do. It's not this foreign concept. Because unless you're indigenous and native to this land, as in like from our you know, Native American ancestors and folks that you know unfortunately have been impacted the most in many ways, we're all immigrants, we're all we're all these other nuances. And with that, like, that's what makes me excited. And I know that there's parts of me and others I have not discovered yet, which is someone who has like probably undiagnosed ADHD, like, <laughs> like that's exciting for me that there's still more and that less is more and more is less, right? Like, as I said, when I found out about being multiracial, especially multiracial in the UK, I'm like, I'm more, not less. And it's one of those things where, you know, also less is more where, you know, I don't need to like, you know, have all my friends be the same type of multiracial person as me or all multiracial in the UK. Like, I hope that, you know, this conversation, especially the recording reaches more audiences than just people who are of Japanese descent. Um, it's one of those things where I think National Geographic showed a picture at one point of like, this is what America oh. looked like. Um, and it was a very mixed multiracial person. And as much as like, I was like, yay, it also probably scared the crap out of some people. Yeah. Because white supremacy is real. So with that, that picture hope, gives me hope and excitement. And I wanna keep evolutionizing the language and the lessons around that photo. So it's again, not just liberation for some, but liberation for all. I think that's, a, that's an excellent note to end on. So thank you all so much, uh, Selena, Ayan Ozada. I can't thank you enough for all of your help leading up to this event and shaping it and also for your time here today. Uh, thank you to the Eastside Freedom Library for managing the logistics thank here and you. making sure we had a smooth program. Uh, Holly, our ASL interpreter, who wound up being the interpreter for the full two hours instead of trading <laughs> off, but uh, we can't thank you enough for that. 